ladies and gentlemen, friends, colleagues, and listeners, here we are again. Excuse me. <clears throat> I just had to clear my throat there. We were having a little discussion pre-going live about Only Fools and Horses and who was playing which character. So it's needless to say, um, it's lovely to be back again with Rodney, played by Stephen Dixon. And um, we got Trigger on production in the background. But on a serious note, here we are again. Another week in aviation. And my God, Steve, they're flying by. Hello, Dale. Good morning. How are you doing? Not too. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it's not granddad or uncle. But yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, all good. All good. And you? Um, yeah, a bit flat this week, to be honest with you. Um, looking for um, looking for those sunlit uplands that I'm, I'm yet to discover that uh, have been mentioned in the press. Was it the crocuses? The sunlit uplands and the and the crocuses, flowering crocuses. I'm yet I'm yet to see many of them, to be honest with you. But um, nonetheless, we're here, we're alive, and um, and uh, I'm glad to be with you this morning, Chris. And a beautiful, inspiring message just above your heart, sir. The um, the Centre of Applied Data Science, indeed. Hey. Another, another another freebie. If it's if it's not a, if it's not a, a pair of pajamas that I've nicked off an airplane, it's a it's a it's a teacher that I've got for going along to a seminar once or twice in my in my in my in my in my life. Yeah, but very appropriate. Eh? Follow the data, not the dates. That's absolutely right, Chris. Yeah, I think um, uh, very evident this week we're seeing. Uh, I mean, great to see some you know some particularly countries uh, uh, close to us in the UK, the UK government and the Scottish government coming out with their with their um, their roadmaps to to unlocking the nation, um, which I think is really good and really positive. It certainly gives people some hope, um, you know, and in particular that running along in parallel with the vaccination program, I think is really is really uh, really helpful in in trying to you know bring better spirits amongst uh, amongst many. But there's still there's still a lot of negative news around. I've still been thoroughly disappointed this week with the. With the way that um, actually not just disappointed, really quite sad to see you know empty vaccination halls in places oh. like Germany, uh, which really is is terribly sinful. And I can't I can't help but say that, that the only person to blame are the German politicians themselves, uh, Mrs. Merkel and her ministers and the and those around her who who before the evidence was released, um, you know, to suggest that the AstraZeneca vaccine was not suitable for those over 65. And uh, her friend, her partner in crime, uh, Monsieur Macron, uh, said that they were quasi ineffective uh, for those over 65 and that, um, that we wouldn't be touching the AstraZeneca vaccine. After all the stamash that they created about getting the vaccine into the countries uh, across Europe, when, um, when AstraZeneca fell short on their production targets, and then, of course, now to see them sitting there empty, I mean, this really is very much an own goal. So they've got nobody to blame but themselves. I do not blame the public for the for the for the caution. I blame the I blame the leadership uh, for their ineptitude at criticizing a vaccination that only weeks later was fully approved by the WHO uh, for use in all age groups down to 18. And since then, half a million uh, participants in a study. Uh, in Scotland, of all places, my um, my birth, current country of birth. Let's not mention Scotland this week. Lots going on there in the political in the political oh, sphere. Yes. Oh, um, yes. But um, but the but the study showing for certain, Chris, that the AstraZeneca vaccine reduces hospitalisation in the over 65s by 94 percent, more than the Pfizer equivalent at 85 percent. So really, there is nothing to worry about. The WHO have given it the rubber stamp, but of course. It takes a long, long time to unwind that uh, that negative spin, and it really it's an own goal. And I feel very sorry for the German public and the French public who are now suffering as a result, and uh, because of their, their their country's inept leadership. Yeah, no, it's terrible, <clears throat> but it's also terrible that the wrong message goes across, because what you just covered there, at the end of the day, the reason for this is that you know, God forbid, if somebody does get it. The effects of it are not going to put them in hospital and definitely not going to have an increased chance of them of them dying. And that, that's the most important thing. Absolutely. Then it, then it becomes something that we have to live with. Well, I mean, just by chance this morning, this T-shirt ended up, you know, coming from the bottom of the bottom of the pile. And I, uh, you know, under underneath another 30 other polishes I could have worn. But this one came to came to my hand by chance. And anyway, the, the message the message was very clear to me that 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 that, that the data speaks much much louder than the than the um, than the rhetoric and the 
you know, the self-fulfilling prophecies that leaders want to create for their own political purposes. And one can't but help but once again think there's a little bit of green eyes and envy. Um, and uh, as, uh, as, the, as the very populist the newspaper in Germany built, said um, uh, uh, something about, uh, you know, dear Britain, we envy you. And, um, and I did check, I checked it out with a few German friends this week and said, look, does, does this represent the, um, the feeling of the average Jürgen on the street? And uh, his response was, well, it does as much as the sun represents the, uh, the, vo the voice or views of the average Joe on the British street, which I suspect, therefore, it, is, it goes a long way to, 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 to saying that. So, um, yeah, uh, so, much for, um, so much for federalism and working together as a club and bringing yeah, yeah. Good, yeah. good to everybody. I think, I think that, is, um, that is, a, yeah. is a disappointment, Chris. Yeah, no, it is. It is. It's terrible. And it also shows because... Like you were talking about there about green shoots and about things looking better, but the tone of the media is also changing now because so many people, when nobody knows what they don't know, it's easy to be an expert. And like you said, all these politicians, irrespective where they're from, they you know they spent so much time thinking about uh, you know looking up their own South Poles rather than you know what they should have been doing for the good of everybody else that they represent. And now a lot of them, they've got to get up in the morning, look in the mirror and be red faced and, and how they can, you know, how they can come back and, and expect people to forget the things that they said. I mean, it's absolutely pathetic and ridiculous. Oh, absolutely. But but look, Chris, it happens close to home to us as well. I mean, we've got some issues here. Oh, no, it's saying, Steve, everywhere. Where, where I am in Asia, it happens all it happens all over. I mean, look at the problems that we had until recently in um, in the US. And one could argue we still have the the, the new fella sent a rocket into um, into Syria just this week. So I mean, um, I mean, so much for a for a for a kinder, better world and a better president. Um, we've got to be careful what we wish for sometimes. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's incredible, amazing. However, on a I was going to say on a on a on a on a happier tone. I I, I don't mean that for what I'm now about to say. <laughs> but God bless him. Poor old Captain Tom gets buried today. It's his funeral today. Now, for a for a relatively a very a relatively simple, nice, kind man. My, my goodness me, what an impact he made. Not just not just here, but you know, everywhere, all around the world. I mean, it was it was great that people appreciate honesty, sincerity, good values, genuine person, you know, somebody that took his own challenge on. And at that particular point, he inspired people more than people who should be, you know, inspiring as part of their day-to-day -day job. Absolutely, Chris. I think, um, yeah, I read this morning it was um, uh, Captain Sir Tom or Sir Captain Captain Sir Tom. Is that right? Is that the right way around? Um, I, I don't, I don't have that problem of my own honorifics um, or titles to to get muddled up. So apologies if I if I've mangled those. But Captain Sir Tom, yeah, what an inspirational chap, and to see. To see, I mean, thirty-two million pounds of of, oh. uh, of funding that uh, you know that that that, that, sh that 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 probably should have been there anyway, and I suspect was there to a large extent. And the government always said that they would fund the NHS properly through this this term. However, it certainly was supplemental funding that, that that has gone a long way to 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 helping. And um, to see also that a lot of those donations, Chris, as you say, didn't just come from our small British Isles. Um, that came from far and wide, from um, from many parts or corners of the globe. That was my that was my uh, uh, terrible attempt at a, at a sort of a, a Lowlands accent, Scottish accent. <coughs> Not sure why that cropped in there, but uh, nonetheless. Anyway, what 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 a fella! I also read this morning he was a so there was an obituary in the Telegraph, um, and he was um, he was in the um, the Duke of Wellington's regiment, yep. uh, which of course has you know very famous um, very famous regiment. Um, and uh, I was just reading. I saw a picture the other day of the um, of Apsley House, uh, also known as Number One London, which of course is the Duke of Wellington's residence, uh, at the bottom of uh, Hyde Park um, Corner, and uh, and the statue there of um, of uh, of Duke of Wellington on his um, on his steed. Um, and so then it brought back some memories about just sort of that wartime spirit and the kindred spirit. And in fact, Her Majesty the Queen mentioned that in her video on a Zoom call yesterday in trying to. Uh, I'm sure it was. It was not fully contrived, Your Majesty, but there certainly was a message there that we wanted to get out to the public, which was, let's not worry about the vaccine. Let's stop worrying about oneself. Uh, yeah. Let's start yeah. thinking about others. And that's the reason to get vaccinated. But this wartime spirit that has been created really was epitomized by, by the actions of Captain Sir Tom. So God bless you, sir. Uh, and, uh, and may you rest in peace.
Oh, he will, he will, and he'll be joined by he'll be joined by many, many a, a good person following him that he inspired, and and you know some of the youngsters now who've been handicapped who are doing their own walks, you know, uh, war veterans. It's it's just incredible what he's done, and it's nice that they're putting a sword on his coffin, and apart from the regimental message on the other side of the sword, it's got tomorrow will be a better day, <laughs> which is fantastic. He is hoping. Yes, no, it will. It will. It, it always. It always will be. It always will be. Now, moving on. So we've spoken a little bit about politicians and um, blowing wind up their own South Poles. The tone of the media. Now, just something. The um, the seven three seven Max Steve. Interesting to see that the um, you know increased FAA oversight now and the DOT inspection or uh, Inspector General was saying that the regulatory and the certification process wasn't good enough. I mean, that's worrying in itself, huh? Um, yes and no. I, I take a fairly pragmatic view to this. I mean, the regulators, the type, the type regulator, uh, therefore predominantly the FAA and the uh, EASA, um, the type regulators, I guess, have you know entrusted the manufacturers to do the right thing over over many years, and that that entrustment model comes, Chris, by by very uh, robust. Uh, processes, very uh, uh, diligent uh, oversight, management, um, supervision, controls, uh, compliance, assurance—all of the, all of those words that that you'd want to hear about an aircraft OEM. And yeah. so the entrustment, therefore, is is not just something that Boeing or, or sorry, that uh, the FAA or EASA sort of you know uh, flip out overnight. That comes over a very long period of time. So, um, so I think what what sort of you know uh, that reassures me that um, you know that, that that there has been there has been for a long period of time very strong um, you know uh, uh, I guess uh, or the commercial relationship between regulator and the type manufacturer um, uh, shouldn't be seen as one that that, that has the ability to to. Uh, deliver a competitive advantage. So, if you look at the likes of Boeing in the US, they were they were struggling uh, in recent years with narrow body orders, uh, with really a, 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 a you know an airframe of of you know five six decades almost in age. The seven three seven classic airframe the fuselage hasn't changed really since since those days. I'm sure air engineers will will contend that with me. Please feel free. But uh, but I think to a large extent it's the same it's the same aircraft re-engined 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 you know re-avionic suites etc cetera, etc. Cetera. Whereas Airbus really have been at the cutting edge of, 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 of developing, you know, better, better capability. And with the, with the Neo came a real kind of kick up the backside to Boeing that they needed to do something quickly. So I think all of those years of trust, Chris, that had been created and that, that had been engendered between the type regulator and the, or the type certifier and the OEM were completely lost because there was a need for Boeing to react quickly and re-engine the MAX and, and, uh, and do that. Um, do that to maintain, uh, you know, the ground in uh, against Airbus, and of course, as they did so, there were some fundamental errors, both in the way in which Boeing operated and the regulator uh, 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 did so. So I do think that, um, you know, fundamentally, I don't think Boeing is a corrupt organisation. I don't think the FAA is a corrupt organisation. I think they've got years and years and decades of strong pedigree. What I do think is that commercial the commercial imperatives got in the way of good, strong oversight and assurance that um, that allowed them to take the eye off the ball. Consequently, um, Airbus actually, I mean, it, it really it completely backfired, not because the sad loss of life and the loss of confidence, but Airbus really stole the mark. Um, you know, they had the, um, they had the uh, obviously the re-engine, the 320, the Neo option, but then of course Airbus went and bought the, um, uh, bought uh, Bombardier and they got the C-Series, and uh, and that really helped them steal a mark in the sort of the smaller the smaller yeah. narrow body uh, uh, you know twin engine um, uh, uh, aircraft market, which I think you know Boeing had never really been able to tap into, and therefore you know Airbus Airbus stole the show. So fundamentally, I don't think I don't think there was there was the you know I'm I'm terribly concerned about it because I certainly understand you know why it's taken a long time to rebuild that confidence with on, with the market, but also with the um, with the other type regulators. So no surprise there. That there has been some additional oversight, and I would say, you know, just to, to tag on to that, there was, of course, the incident this week. I think with the triple seven, the um, the uncontained engine failure um, uh, out of um, I can't remember where it was, out of out of Dallas or somewhere, wasn't it? Out, going to going to Honolulu. Um, 
probably wasn't out of Dallas, but you'll correct me probably if I'm, if I'm wrong. Um, but, um, you know, uh, somebody said, oh, well, it's boy again. Oh, my goodness. Like, oh, hang on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a 26 it's a year old hull. They're Pratt and Whitney um, engined um, power plants, a Pratt and Whitney power plants. So, um, you know, let's not jump to conclusions. These things, um, these things are often not linked. But of course, the media love yeah. to link yeah. them. And of course, that doesn't help the public in making their, their, own, their own decisions. Which comes back, which comes back to the lovely T-shirt. It's always better to wait before you cast your comment. And um... well, absolutely, and it's so <coughs> easy for us, easy for us to say on a, on a show that really is built on opinion, Chris. But we do have some facts that we throw in there for, for you know, for 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 um for good sake. But the one thing I always say is when I look at um the um sort of the statistics here, I mean, I tell everybody every day, more people died on the road here in Malaysia, died on the road from road accidents, and died from COVID. Yet you're you're not afraid to jump in the back of your motorbike or take your kid with no cash helmet on your on your scooter or your moped. But you are afraid to go into a shopping center. You think that it's deeply, deeply dangerous to get on an aircraft or, or dare I say, a train. So hang on. Let's think about the data. Let's look at it in rel relative sense. Um, in the same way that I now know, know dozens of people who've been vaccinated, but only know less than half a dozen who have coronavirus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, it all depends where you are, what's surrounding you. And, and also, like, like we've said so many times, the way media presents certain things and the way people allow stories to, to drip and run the way they want them to run rather than the way they should be. But um, I think it's a good thing, Steve, that, that this has come to light now because the FAA, they've agreed, I think it's 14 recommendations in the DOT report, which is good. And I think one of the ones, which is a lesson for everything, everybody, everywhere, every organisation, is if you have the same party validating and the same party then verifying on behalf of, of, of a big organisation, that's something that's a little bit too convenient. So I think everywhere, everywhere where anybody is assessing risk or assessing compliance, it's a, you know, that's something that's important for, for people. To, well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of regulatory models like that, Chris, in the world. I mean, the, the, uh, the, the UK CA model is that. It's the entrustment model. They entrust the operator. Uh, and the the UK the, the regulator will will uh, um, you know uh, review and assess their control measures and their their SMS and their their broad compliance uh, uh, model and the statement of compliance and how they manage continual ongoing airworthiness requirements and QA QC etc. The CA don't often get down and read you know do individual audits of individual events or individual turnarounds or individual uh, aircraft. They expect the operators to have a level of of uh, uh, assurance that, that that deems them compliant uh, with this, with the overall standard. So I guess there's there's a there's a balance, right? I think what, that's what you're saying. There's, there's a balance between you know sort of hammer and nail. Actually, you know, yeah. overly overly obsessive regulators in some parts of the world that exist that I can't mention uh, for, <laughs> for fear of, of, of losing which whichever client contracts might exist. It, rest of them but but, there, but we do know that there are there are obsessive regulators that that, that you know they only issue very uh, small uh, uh, um, sort of uh, uh, this span of, or, or a very very tight span of control yeah. and we know that regulators are very hands off uh, there's probably a balance to be had yeah thing that the thing that annoys me Stephen we've both worked we've both worked and have an experience now where you know people people tend to want the certificate or the tick box exercise rather than the actual practice and culture and DNA that goes with doing something properly. And, you know, so many audits and so many now accreditation bodies are, are basically franchises who need to have a revenue stream and they come in and they're more of a, well, you know, if you do this or if you say you're going to do that and that's all wrong. It's also wrong for the, for the employees because they see that there's then a lack of credibility and a lack of backbone from their senior management and they're not being led from the front and it's wrong and and hopefully touch wood that sort of um that sort of culture is going to start to change now as we as we bring back or bounce for back sure. after, for after sure. this crisis you know no absolutely i think you you know i were having a conversation this week for, for, a, for a separate purpose on exactly that because the, yeah. the 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 you know you you give you know the tick box exercise gives the operator a false sense of security that they're doing things right so when people like you or I come along and you know spend an hour in a terminal or a half an hour, you know a, a day on the ramp or or a day looking through records, uh, it, it 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 sort of you know you uncover 
a minefield of problems um, that they say, well, yeah, but we just had an IATA audit last week, or we just had an ICA uh, audit, yeah. or we now also audit, and they didn't, they didn't find this. Well, what were they looking for then? Because I suspect they're not looking in the right place. It's like, it's like, it's like you know, where do you find the bodies? Well, I think some of us have done this long enough to know where the bodies are generally buried. Um, and it's all about the questions that one asks, um, Chris. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're, if you're reading a compliance statement, so most of these, these IOSA or ISEGO checklists are exactly that. They're a list of, please check for this at this point, which of course the operator has. So everything is presented and the boxes tick. The reality is actually when you go into the field and under the bonnet, that none of that exists at all. It's a complete fallacy. So who are you kidding? You're only kidding yourselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and uh, the most important thing of the lot now is is a, a, a proper, genuine commitment. And I keep saying this, and I'll probably people are saying, "Why don't you shut up or whatever?" If they're if they're if they're interested in it. But, they can um, switch off if they want to. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I'll keep. I'll still, I'll still keep talking. About that. But seriously, though, people want to know that their senior management and their leadership cares about the business and about them. And obviously caring about caring about, you know, your your um, your business, obviously, your employees, the people, the customers caring about tomorrow's like Captain Tom would say. And also, you know, caring about simple values. And if those values are simple enough and everybody understands them, then live to them not turn it on and off and it, there's nothing worse than being on the ground and being told right you got to clean everything up put this away do this don't accept this because we've got an audit tomorrow they yeah. just think what on earth are you lot talking yeah about? absolutely and that difference between you know soaring soaring up at the top with the eagles you know and having to plod along with the penguins on the bottom floor is a you know it's such a difference and that's where things go wrong is on the floor and people need to spend more time down there and looking at what's going on really. Absolutely, Chris. Absolutely. Yeah. Now some, a little bit of good news, IAG, IAG. So they've, they've announced now some very good results from a cargo perspective, which is brilliant. And um, so uh, you've got Lynn Embleton saying how well they've done. And obviously everybody in cargo has done well. The ironic thing is, the ironic thing is it's almost like, you know keep it quiet people people don't want to say now how well cargo has been doing because obviously everybody else unfortunately are you know are having a bad time i mean you've got the finance sector you know they're a law to their own it's incredible what's going on there but as far as cargo is concerned they've done exceptionally exceptionally well and having spent almost all my life in cargo um, that is such a wonderful thing now to raise the profile of the business and to make everybody from airports, from airlines, from everybody start to appreciate it more. So for IAG to say what they did about their results, I think is great news. And especially as they, 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 they were no longer a freight to carrier. So they've now realized how important it is. Um, I think the yields especially are incredible now in cargo. So I, I'm not saying long may they stay as expensive as they are, but long may they stay realistic so that everybody like hand and agents and everybody else can eke a decent living out of the business. Well, I think just, just, just to balance that, Chris, I guess the cargo side might be doing exceptionally well, but of course those, those that are affected yeah, yeah. by the passenger side are, 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 are in terrible, terrible strife. And, um, and, and sorry, know, sorry, as, Steve, sorry, I do apologize now for that. I 100% agree with that, 100% appreciate it. You know, I just think had it not been for cargo, you know, things could have been absolutely terrible. So they shouldn't be too ashamed by saying how, you know, how, how successful it's been, because that's what the world needs. The world needs to tick along. And, and Well, it's nice. It's nice to see cargo that often, you know, for, 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 for decades played second fiddle to passengers, Chris, is um, it's getting up there again, you know, and, yeah, uh, yeah. and um, you know, I say that sort of tongue in cheek, but, uh, but the reality is, um, you know, people didn't realize the importance of cargo, um, you know, whilst it, whilst you were sitting, you know, you're sitting in your, in your seat and, you know, what was sat below you, you thought your bag was there, but the average Joe public had no idea how important air cargo was and actually how much air cargo pre COVID flew on passenger aircraft. And that's been a big, big challenge as we well know, but on the passenger side, I mean, the passenger business has, has, has done terribly, Chris, such a result that, um, that, you know, IEG posted the, their um, um, yeah, yeah. Loss, uh, last year loss for uh, six and a half billion quid. Um, now, six and a half billion quid, that oh, is oh, oh. Yeah. pretty intense. 
uh, that along with all of the the fleet um, 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 retirements, you know, the fleet retirements, particularly on the on the on the jumbo fleet and the um, you know parking up a, a massive number of the of the, of the fleet, and also um, you know the ten thousand staff that are being made redundant as a result of this. So, so that we don't you know we mustn't sort of forget just to sort of bring it back into context. There, there is still a massive challenge that sort of lies ahead. Um, there, but it's very good to see IG with all the cargo only flights have been operating. I think they've done a great job. Of course, the boss of IG Cargo, ironically, now goes to become Aer Lingus um, CEO. Yeah. Um, and that's great news. But the markets, I mean, the market, despite despite the news, the market responded well. Um, you know, IG share price just uh, closed yesterday it was almost almost topping two quid. Now, now a month ago, Chris, it was it was at one pound forty. So um, you know, something is. Um, Something is going well there, and um, so I think uh, you know it's um, it's starting to recover. Hopefully, I think the the analysts and the investors see you know that there's that there is um, there is life beyond COVID, um, and structurally, I think Willie has left the business in good shape now that he's off to IATA and Luis picks up the reins. Um, you know, and uh, you know, hopefully, after sort of the material changes that have been made, um, you know, in terms of the very sad losses of a lot of the fleet that we all loved. Um, and, uh, and of course, a lot of people, but, um, but however, hopefully that gives, gives them a very good footing to, 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 to get back into good shape. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. And please God, this bring back better and then the bounce back better will make such a huge difference, which brings us to a point when, when and, and how all of these things happen, Steve, will also, um, you know, will also have a big, a big impact on, on training. And we've spoken about this for quite some time. And, you know, the types of training that's going to be necessary and needed now, especially with so many people um, having, you know, been, left the company, whether it's, you know, practical sizing or, or they decided they've had enough or early retirement or whatever. There's an awful lot of experience that's gone now. And to, you know, to re-energize people who have been left in positions now where they're having to be responsible for, you know, a shift or a team or a department, but they haven't actually been given that sort of support and also how to manage people who are now coming back with a totally different mindset and attitude and, and mental state. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we, 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 uh, you know, in terms of looking at the traffic now, I think we've we sort of hit rock bottom from where we, from where we are. Um, so, Hello. sorry, my son has just- Hello, been... Evan, how are you? You're coming, you, have you come in, you've come in to correct your dad? Sorry, um, you know, I think, I think, I think traffic, hello, has, um, traffic has hit the rock bottom now from where hello. you want to say hello. Yeah, sorry, folks. Um, hello. we've got we've got somebody else on the show. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Um, I think where we are, you know, traffic traffic sort of hit rock bottom now, Chris. The UK has gone from being, you know, the world's third largest aviation market and Europe's largest aviation market for decades to now to now, you know, playing, you know, um, second fiddle, not even second fiddle. You know, uh, is the is the sixth. You know, Russia bizarrely now is the largest. Yeah. We did, don't call it European aviation market. Um, but the UK now sort of languishing at the bottom there, Chris. However, I do think given so so what would happen now? You've got this dichotomy. So there's there's very little in the way of capacity out there right now. Um, in the UK, Germany, Spain, yeah. France, you know, most of mainland Europe. Um, as we grow, I think uh, he's got boredom. Of listening to his dad already that's no no surprise Mate, there. Let, let, let's hope we're not losing others like like, like most of our listeners oh well, we're probably probably spiked in spiked in viewership there as evan walked into shots and they've all disappeared again yeah but i think what will happen chris as we as you know the the vaccine penetrates through europe and we get we get you know every sort of the vaccine uh, numbers increasing um uh, and i think europe mainland europe will be a long long time i think it seems very very slow at the minute but the uk is picking up what we'll find is there'll be this really quick uptick. Now, particularly after we see, you know, I don't know what this global travel task force does that's set up by the UK government, chaired by chaired by the Secretary of State for Transport. Um, say that sort of. Uh, yes, I was waiting for that. Deflated whenever I think about that man, um, who only yesterday, of course, now has confirmed the um, extension of the slot waiver to. Um, yes, to yes, yes. Summer, uh, summer twenty one. Uh, one of his good. calls to re-energize the industry. Exactly, but um, you know, so as we see, you know, I think they'll say majority of. I think the UK is now at um, over thirty percent of adults are vaccinated. Uh, just hit twenty million this weekend as we're on as we're recording this, which is which is 
phenomenal. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they reckon that by by May June that um, that you know the, the a significant portion that must be upwards of eighty percent of UK adults will be vaccinated. Now that people are now starting to think, and the Prime Minister did nothing to alleviate this sort of thought, which was actually we can start to travel again and we can you know maybe start opening up. And of course, next month the um, the Global Travel Task Force will report on what the what the this the, the sort of the, the state of uh, state of the nation is when it comes to travel. Um, but does that mean then that people start booking massively now, as we've seen and we've heard from EasyJet? We heard that this week. The EasyJet are seeing was it six hundred percent increase in bookings? Aren't yeah. Yeah. staggering? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or maybe not. Maybe not given how given its relative. But oh, no, um, it was. Yeah. Yeah. But. Um, uh, that certainly bodes well. What does that mean then to your question, Chris, in terms of, you know, people start getting vaccinated more, uh, majority population is vaccinated, government come up with a travel plan to reopen travel. Uh, people start then saying, well, actually from May, June, we can have domestic travel. From June, July, you can start thinking about international travel. Uh, all very well, providing you go into places that accept, you know, got borders open and will accept you with a, with a, with a passport or a vaccination passport or whatever. What does that then do to airlines that want to recover? Well, of course, the, the massive, uh, you know, uptick in um, in, uh, in 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 capacity and seats in the market, and therefore the supply chain has to respond to that. But the supply chain right now is on its knees, both in terms of depleted resources, specifically yeah. who have yeah. been made redundant or on retrenchment or uh, furloughed or whatever, lost the currency, lost recency. Um, lost, you know, uh, the ability to, or not the ability, but lost the lost their sort of their their validity in the in the organisation to rebuild that sort of place as we as we recover, and I think that's going to be a big challenge. So how does one do that? I think there'll be lots of questions asked, uh, and I think there's some some inter industry discussions happening this week, uh, uh, you know, to to potentially support that. But it, it it certainly needs it needs a good hard look, Chris, because the, the last thing we want. Is for is for somebody who's not pushed back an aircraft for six months or nine months, you know, doing a tick box exercise. Well, let's push back one aircraft, get job done, you're fine, off you go. Um, you know, let's get an LDL out. The next week, he, he punctures an aircraft because he's not been on shift for six days. He's done the tick box all right, but everything else then goes down and after that. I think that is a problem that we need to be very, very careful of, very mindful of. And I do think that airlines are asking their handlers those questions already. And I've certainly been exposed to that. I think those are the right questions to be asking. Yeah, 100%. Along, along, with, the, um, along with the equipment maintenance, uh, because they have to you know, re, re-license, re-service to get back quick enough. So I agree with you, Steve. As soon as this bounce back comes, it's going to be phenomenal. And the pressure is going to be on the industry. And then people will be asking why. And, every, and then, then you're going to get politicians and media turning around saying, well, you wanted to get it back quick, now you're not able to take it on board. Yeah. So, you know, now's the time to start preparing. Now, IATA are talking about the, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 cash burn, and obviously that's a terrible thing, but they're also talking now about, you know, preparations for restart. And I know Nick Kareen is looking at the industry restart, but they, they've spoken about, obviously, the, you know, the, the, um, the sad realities of the data, but they're also now looking at the difference between an optimistic scenario and also a pessimistic one. So, you know, the optimistic one, you know, they're looking at, they're looking at, like we've just said, you know, huge, huge changes and probably more changes that will happen with how countries accept or don't accept those that have had good vaccines. Um, So again, coming back to your T-shirt, the data around whether or not if you've had a vaccine, you're less likely to spread it, et cetera, et cetera that might also stimulate countries who need that tourism injection whilst they're, whilst they're combating their own vaccine program. So there's lots of combinations still to come, but I definitely think, Steve, I know, I know we've spoken about it several times, um, about the, um, you know, whether or not to have a visa or a passport, but I definitely think it's going to come. And I definitely think it's going to come in, in, um, in venues, theatres, concerts. I think anybody who wants to run one, they're going to focus not on the people who are saying oh, you shouldn't have to have a vaccine and you shouldn't have to be limited to this, that or the other. They, they've got to care about themselves and their businesses and everybody that works for them. And if they think that they can have a filtered, a filtered attendance, which will cause less problems, I think they'll do it. 
So a private members club for the for the for the for the, for the happy few to be vaccinated. Then is that what it, you're suggesting? It, it 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 depends. It depends how you look at it, Steve. But I definitely, I definitely, I definitely feel you know so many people. When you listen to the argumentation for having a vaccine and those that say that you shouldn't, and 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 the few, the few that would have fallout and problems because they don't have it, I think that's where that's where intelligent focus has to be. How do you make it easier for those people to have access, et cetera, or, or whatever, rather than a yes or a no? But I think at the end of the day, Steve, and like like the Queen herself, you know, it's not about yourself, it's about others. And and vaccines are Oh, that's all that's all very well. At the point, yes, at the point that you can guarantee that there is universal availability of the vaccine. But there is not. Yeah. There is not universal availability of the vaccine. And therefore, you still create a two-tier state and a two-tier system of the haves and the have-nots. So what about somebody who is 18 years old that will not get the vaccine potentially for two years, but they can drink in a pub, but they can't access the pub with their family, sit down for a, a three-course meal in the no, pub no, with no. their family, in the local harvester? Is that what you're suggesting? No, no, no. And dare I say, dare I say, now you're casting, you're casting a little bit of prejudgment there suggesting that I eat in the harvester. I'd like you to know, my friend, I have lost a considerable amount of weight and it's down to my wife's good cooking. And I am, and, and there's also nothing wrong with a harvester. So let's not be getting, you know, going out there on these, these little wing winglets. Okay, what I'm saying, Steve, is youngsters, they can have a test. And if the test is, if the test is negative within a short period of time, then no problem. It's but does a taxpayer pay for the test or do they pay for the test? Steve, Steve, I'm just saying, it's a combination. If there's the will, there will be a way, but not just to stop it. Because also the reason that the vaccines are so important and the reason they rolled them out for the elderly is because they were the most susceptible. Now, if- That's right. In, in, that in, in, the, in the same way, in the same way that some camps have chosen a different approach. So I, I, I signed up here in Malaysia for my vaccine. It's highly unlikely that I'll get it before the end of the year. So more, more chance of me getting vaccinated in the UK. Yeah. But I signed up here for my vaccine. And um, in the Malaysian system, as you see here, uh, what they've chosen to do is, um, so for those that can see, it says, this is on the screen, I don't know if you can see that, but it basically yeah, yeah, says- we'll go for the younger ones. Yeah, we're currently in phase one of the vaccination program for frontliners. Yes. So frontliners are police, are doctors, are health professionals, are teachers and so on. That's not the approach of most countries. Most countries, it's based on age and vulnerability. Yeah. Um, because, um, so I do think there is, I mean, the, 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 there was a lot of unhappy unions this week in the UK because the JCVI, the Joint Committee for Vaccination and Immunization, uh, terribly sad that I remember these things. I've clearly got little, too much time on my hands. Uh, but the JCVI um, said, we will not change um, uh, the rollout prioritization for uh, for professions, we'll do it by age group because that is the most scientific way to do this based on a risk profile. Instead, others, politicians, get, get caught up in the heat and the spin and the rhetoric from people like unions and trade groups and lobby groups, business groups, albeit as well, that say, well, we should get our people that work in pubs vaccinated first and get the pubs open, or we should get teachers vaccinated because they get children, but it's not proven. So, I, I, Chris, I, I think there's there's different ways to skin the cat, but I do think it's a very dangerous, slippy road that one is going down if you say, well, you can come in if you're vaccinated and you can't come in if you're not. That, for me, is difficult. Steve, I, I didn't say it's not difficult, but also coming back now to the frontliners, somebody also said during the week as well that that's why for the police, that somebody who's a police officer at 45 will be vaccinated earlier than the police at 45 because of the risk level. Yeah. Now, now, like if you walk into any city centre, OK, you walk into any city centre in the world and, and, and something that I always I always tend to look for is it's always nice to be walking into an Irish pub. OK, well, no matter where you are, because it's a certain it, you, you know what you well, basically, you know, pretty much what you're going to get. Right. Point of Kilkenny and a stick and get us by. Perfect. And, and yeah. Again, I'm just saying, you know what you're going to get, right? And I love it, all right? So that's me. Now, I don't, I don't choose now at the moment, unless, unless I've been in the Irish pub for too long, to go into a, a nightclub, a crazy nightclub, okay? But that's my choice. So I think, I think with the passports, there'll also be choice as well, Steve. There'll still be venues that will be open to people at whatever age or whatever, whatever it is, 
But what I'm saying is there's nothing wrong with somebody wanting to protect their business by feeling that consumers will be more confident if it has a certain restriction, because again, they're at, they're, so, they're, 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 they're evaluating their own risk. And, and I'm pretty sure as well, Steve, when all this starts to die out, there's still going to be lots of people worried about being in crowds. There's still going to be lots of people going to continue wearing masks. I think that's a good thing. Okay. So there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of fallout and a lot of learning from this crisis. But then, Chris, I mean, if we transfer that into our industry then, so you think about think about airlines competing for the same passengers. Are you saying that if, if, if for example, Ryanair in Ireland, domiciled in Ireland, that, that if the Irish government took a different approach to the UK government, uh, and they might well do, I don't know, but I'm just saying there's an example, if they allowed private sector to, it to immunise their frontliners, and those frontliners at first, and those frontliners included cabin crew and pilots, yeah, in the UK, Ryanair compete heavily with the likes of EasyJet and British Airways and short haul routes. But the UK government said, no, absolutely, you cannot. You will follow the JCV, JCVI direction. Are you suggesting that's a competitively good advantage for Ryanair to have with the likes of EasyJet and British Airways? No, Stephen. And I'm not suggesting... That sounds like what you're saying about pubs and restaurants, Chris. No, no, Steve. I'm just saying as a person, if it was my business, okay, if it was my business, just like... On the, on, on the airlines, right? If a particular country says we would welcome anybody with a vaccine, okay, then they're going to need a passport. And if they're doing that because of, of reducing risk to themselves whilst they are able to elevate their own vaccinations to then open up everybody, then so be it, Steve. But it, it, you're not going to be able to please everybody all of the time. And, and I just feel, you know, if, if there's a chance now to reduce risk to an acceptable level, why would I, why would I not do it if it was my business? Well, that's right. It reminds me of the, um, of the old saying, you can please some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. And I believe that was said with a different word and it wasn't please, it was fool. On that, on that bombshell? On that bombshell, mate. Moving on. <laughs> Moving on. Um, so now, right, so we're talking now about, you know, coming back. So one of the things, another another person that we've spoken about here is is the the outgoing, the outgoing head of IATA. So Mr. De Juniac is talking about having global standards, which comes into what you and me have just been saying there now. Um, you know, so, you know, what 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 are the global standards and that everybody should follow them. So that's important. OK. But also, also about health credentials. So it's becoming clear that vaccines and testing will play the role, Steve. So again, I come back to it. If you've been vaccinated or you're happy to do a test, and the test is in the right is in the right result, then you should be allowed to go anywhere you want. I think that's absolutely fine. I think from a from a from a travel perspective, I think that's absolutely okay. I think we've we've been used to that for years. I mean, people that go, you know, travel from Birmingham to Alicante may not have been because they that's that's not what they're what they're used to. But those that have traveled further afield have been used to having things like, you know, typhoid or or yellow fever or you know, uh, malaria tablets, Chris, as you know. We, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I remember all that. Yeah. yeah. We and you and you've got to certify that and, and bring all the documentation. So I don't, I don't fundamentally have a problem with for travel governments. Governments, for a purpose of entry, can say what they like. My fundamental issue is, is this sort of uh, thought that it is acceptable in a very, in a very sort of um, uh, Orwellian way to suggest that um, that if you have got this ticket, you can you can come in. If you don't, then you can't. And sorry, you're out on your limb. Um, maybe oh. maybe I'm too much of a libertarian, but um, I, I do find that troubling. Yeah, and and troubled troubled as you may be. I've got something for you that when I see you next, I shall give you one of these because I hate to see you troubled. Now, positive <laughs> things and technology moving on. Okay. I'm loving, I'm loving the show this week, just to say, Chris, this is a, you know. Toronto I, airports, okay, are looking at now a new. I missed that. Which airport? Toronto. Toronto airport. Point, point of need testing research. So the Greater Toronto Airports Authority they announced a robust new COVID-19 PCR and antigen testing research program at Toronto Pearson Airport. And, and basically it's designed to explore the efficacy of antigen testing compared with a rapid polymerase chain reaction, the PCR, PCR. test in a high throughput commercial environment, as well as the operationalization of rapid PCR testing in an airport environment. And 
anything now that can speed all of this up, Steve, this covers all the other, the other issues or the other sides to the arguments that we're having. And the quicker, and please God, these things will be able to be done so quickly. That's one of the, one of the it's just like having a security check, it will be, you know, until such time as populations have got enough, whether it's herd immunity or, or, or full vaccinations. So tremendous shout out again, as we're coming into spring, we're almost, we're almost Monday. I mean, my God, 1st of March on Monday. How quickly has that gone by? I, I'm having, um, I'm having a, a relapse. Um, <laughs> um, maybe not a relapse, maybe, um, maybe that's not the right word, but I'm certainly having a recollection, Chris, that this, that this journey that you and I started on started in about the second week of March last yes. year. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And therefore, it's coming up to it. We're coming up to about our uh, this must be about our 48th or 49th episode, I suspect, given with a short break for Christmas. Um, but uh, yeah, first of March, who would have thought we'd have been in this position almost one year on? <clears throat> and in fact, <clears throat> excuse me, rather clear the frog in my throat, uh, that you know, for, for China, more than one year on. Um, ironically, China seems to have done rather well out of this. Um, uh, yeah. the skeptics. The skeptics will say, um, I'm a xenophile, as you know, so I, I look at it slightly differently, but um, uh, I'm not naive enough to think that their numbers are, um, are robust when it's come to reporting, let's just say that. Um, um, uh, interestingly, um, I think the industry will come, you know, whilst it's been a long slog, Chris, much longer than any of us would have anticipated or, or projected a year ago, I think we'll come out of this stronger. I think a couple of things resonate for me. One is, one is, one is, you know, the ability to 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 do things differently, uh, and you know, our industry certainly amongst hospitality and leisure has been the hardest hit. Um, and the resilience that aviation has shown, whether it's from earthquakes or volcanoes or global financial crises or or terrorist attacks or 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 whatever, uh, has you know has 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 you know, it's always shown great resilience, but nothing nothing more so than this. I'm surprised that so few airlines we've lost so few airlines in this in this process. So I think this whole thing you mentioned about building back better um, uh, or bringing back better. Sorry, as you might you might say, um, uh, Prime Minister has maybe copyright. Uh, yeah, I, I disagree with Boris on this one. When he says build back, it insinuates that something's been demolished or 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 absolutely. Well, well, one one could certainly argue that the aviation industry has been demolished in, in large parts in some. Airports, it's, you know, down ninety-five percent. I think that is fair to say it's been demolished. Yes, absolutely. If there's anything left, Steve, and I also, I well, also, I also rebuilt a house and I had to keep one wall. And every now and again, I go and stand by it and remember what it was like before. To bring back <coughs> now is what what so we I, need to focus on. I do think they'll come back stronger as a result of people approaching things differently. They've approached problems and challenges differently. Yep. They've innovated uh, uh, and they've had to do that for survival. The other thing is cash has become much more of a critical uh, measure and index in terms of measuring and reporting on success. Whereas before it might have been profitability yep. or you know, return on invested capital or return on, and growth. on capital employed um, and growth. Yeah, I think, I think those, those are all good measures. But I think cash has been what has, has really prevailed here. If it were not for access to cash at low, low interest rates, historically low interest rates today, I suspect we'd have lost many more yeah, airlines. 100%, 100%, yeah. And the third thing is, I do think that, um, that the customers will, will be really appreciate, appreciate travel more when, it come, when we come out of this. And um, you know, some people have really enjoyed being at home. I can tell you, I was a bit deflated this week. I, I'm struggling now and I'm, I'm, I'm finding it tough. Having having not um, not been back to Europe for four months, um, <clears throat> it's um, it's getting hard. You're smiling there, Chris. I know you are smiling, but um, but it, but uh, Europe I'm is where, um, get, I'm looking forward to you coming back, son. Yeah, I'm looking forward to my bottle of whiskey. It's in your it's in your kitchen. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, but I do think that people will be looking to travel more often now, Chris. I think they appreciate that more. Hundred percent. I think I think they'll maybe be spending more on travel than before, or they'll do many more shorter trips to to sort of, um, uh, and therefore I think that brings with it great opportunity. Yeah. Um, for the for the survivors as we as we come out of this, but um, 
Yeah, 12 months on. Uh, well, well, well. I'll let, let, let's hope that you've got a special anniversary show planned for us. We have, we have, we have, we have. And it would be fantastic if there's better news then. But I, I just want to add to what you're saying, Steve. When it, when it bounces back and it's brought back better, the ironic thing is if you look at entertainment, hospitality, all the things that people love to do outside of the work they have to do to be able to, to do that, to get some sort of reason for what they're doing, that's been affected so badly. And my goodness me, people are going to want to, they just want to want to embrace that so much now when it comes back. So, you know, please God, anybody that can hang on, you know, they're going to be hit with a tsunami of, of positivity and, and people wanting to spend money and wanting to have a good time and spend time with people that matter. And, and you know, I think that's, that's the Absolutely. most important thing. And for businesses, I think, again, just to be a little bit... Um, a, a, well, a little bit. I was going to say picky, pushy, whatever. You mentioned cash. I think it's a it's a it's a relationship, cash and care. When people come back, they're going to remember the companies and the organisations and how they cared about people and customers. And oh, I think, and I absolutely. think they should be making that known by their by their footfall, by their support, and also by companies that they want to work for. You yeah. should always work right. for companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. As we said before, you live by the sword and you die by the sword. And um, and I think uh, customers will remember immensely this period in which, you know, with, with you know, and you've got to, you've got to put into context how challenging it was. But they remember, you know, which, which airlines and which travel operators and which tour operators were, were, were well, let's say, kind to them. Maybe yep. not, maybe not, you know, responding with a full cash refund or whatever, but something something akin to, to that would be would have gone down well. The other thing is, I think employees will remember which employers were good to them. And just on yep. that on that note, as we finish this, I know we're drawing in for time, but I spoke to a, a crew member this week who used to work for Norwegian, uh, yep. based in based in Gatwick, and how terribly, terribly, terribly upset, disappointed, and angry they were to have been to been told mistruths, to have not been told, uh, or, 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 or to have not been entrusted, um, you know, with information that... Um, the company clearly possessed but didn't want to share with the uh, with the employee groups uh to have a very sort of uh, uh cloak and dagger type relationship between employer and employee is deeply unhelpful and uh, i think um i think they and i recognize um, how difficult that has been and no surprise that that the norwegian announced the massive losses that they did and the near billion euros of debt you know carry i mean it's just a very very distasteful and unfortunate situation unlike the likes of you know, other carriers who were pretty upfront about how how deep and, uh, and 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 long this crisis was going to go on, and how quickly they had to respond. Actually, they uh, at the beginning took a lot of criticism from the unions, if you remember, and employers that you and I know well, because they're close to your heart. Um, but um, but actually, have now turned around and said, actually, you were right. You know, this 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 was the right thing to do. You know, uh, let's preserve as many jobs as we could. I think we're seeing that now, and um, and, and and I'm pleased for that. So. For the employer and employee going forward as well, I think there is there is much more to be to be done. Yeah, and I think Steve, and I, I hope that it's going to happen naturally. But if it doesn't, people should focus on it. Those that are being served when things open up, respect the people that are serving you, and those that are serving give the best customer service so that those Absolutely. people come back again. Yeah. And if, if people do that, then poor old Captain Tom to finish with. Tomorrow will definitely be a better day. Thank you, sir. As we, well approach, as we approach our anniversary, have to work out what T-shirts we wear and what we talk about and who we recognise. I think we should have a we should have a best story award for the year. We should have a most inspirational person of the year. We should do whatever. We we come up with our own little little um, award <laughs> ceremony. But anyhow, listen. It's always a pleasure. Great to see you, and look forward to seeing you back in Europe soon. And uh, stay well, and thank thank Evan for his for his intervention. <laughs> he, saved, he saved the show. Thanks, Chris. Take care, mate. All the best. Yeah.